Thank you. And uh, just before we move on to the next item of business, uh, I want to draw members' attention to a revision to the ministerial code in relation to parliamentary uh, liaison officers, which comes into force from today. Up to now this session, PLOs have uh, been required to declare their appointment the first time they participate in parliamentary business relating to the portfolio of their cabinet secretary. I'm pleased to advise you that following a request from the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee, the First Minister has now revised the code requiring PLOs to declare every time they are participating in business relating to their cabinet secretary, and this applies from today. I'm sure that members will agree that this is a welcome change to procedure which will enhance the transparency of parliamentary business. And the first item of business is topical questions. And our first question is from Willie Rennie. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports of intolerable working conditions at Amazon's Fife warehouse. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. It's important that all employees in all workplaces are treated fairly and the Scottish Government is doing everything it can within its powers to drive up employment standards and promote good working practices with the powers available to us. Will there any? Reports about camping outside the centre and an undercover reporter have lifted the lid on Amazon. In one case, the company penalised a worker for being in hospital with a kidney infection. The Scottish Government paid almost £1 million to Amazon last year, even though it did not pay all its workers the real living wage. Can the Minister rule out paying Amazon any more grants in future? Cabinet Secretary. All the grants which were previously awarded to Amazon have been paid and the conditions attached to them have been fulfilled. I think it's also true to say that, of course, those grants go back many years to 2005. I would also say that uh, I am concerned about the reports over the weekend. I've been in touch, my office has been in touch with Amazon, uh, and we are working on uh, establishing a meeting to take place within the next seven days so these issues can be raised. Of course, these matters are of concern to the Scottish Government, as will be of concern to anybody. It's important that we do what we can to raise them. We do not have the powers in terms of either the living wage uh, or in terms of some other employment laws which allow us to take the action that we'd like to take. We'd like to legislate for a living wage. We've said that on many occasions. Um, in the absence of that, what we can do is make representations and speak to Amazon and make clear how we find these practices uh, unacceptable, and that's what will happen over the course of the next few days. Willie Rennie. I'm afraid the Minister has ducked my question. Uh, when I raised this with the First Minister before, on numerous occasions, she previously sent Rosanna Cunningham to the Amazon plant. What happened with that meeting? Did she tell them that they would receive no grants? And if not, why not? It's about time the government gave some clarity on whether it will give Amazon grants in the future. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I have just said to Willie Rennie, we have no outstanding grants. We have no proposals for further grants from Amazon. We have no intention of providing those further grants, not least in the absence of any application. The applications which were made and the conditions attached to them have been fulfilled. The grants have been paid, as were the grants made by the previous administration under the Liberal Democrats and the Labour Party. The same conditions, I would imagine, applied at that time as well. I think it is very important that we do what we can to bring jobs to Scotland, which is the purpose of these grants. But, of course, it is also very important that we promote fair work and fair work practices. And that will be the focus of the meeting that I have with Amazon in the coming days. Jackie Bailey. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that Amazon has a global value of £290 billion, £6 billion in revenues in the UK, yet they pay very little tax. They get employees to opt out of the Working Time Directive to get a job and, as we've already heard, threaten workers with the sack if they're off sick or pay so little that staff are camping out to avoid travel costs. Now, I understand what the Cabinet Secretary is saying about grants being given to Amazon in the past, but can I ask him, could he review conditions that apply to any regional selective assistance or other grants given by the government to future companies, not just Amazon, but indeed all of them, to reflect fair work practices? Cabinet Secretary. Can I thank uh, Jackie Bailey, first of all, for acknowledging the simple fact that we do not hold these powers in relation to either insisting upon the living wage or in terms of some of the employment practices which she's mentioned. What I would say in relation to future grants, it would be the case, I think, we'd want to continue to look 
uh, at each application that's made on its merits. And the reason why I say that is because uh, Jackie Bailey will know from the way that the Living Foundation go about their work, they will often work with companies which don't pay a living wage in the idea, the belief and the hope that they can encourage them to paying a living wage. That's one of the, in fact, they can even be given accreditation in advance of paying the living wage. So I think what we do want to do and what the focus of our activity must be on is, of course, first of all, making sure we bring jobs to Scotland and we encourage uh, job creation at the same time as either uh, encouraging uh, those companies which don't currently pay the living wage to do so, or, of course, driving up the nearly 80% uh, of people in Scotland currently paid the living wage. That seems to me to be the practical and responsible way to go about this. Dean Lockhart. Signing officer, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, what steps is he taking to uh, ensure that Amazon is uh, in compliance with existing employment laws? Although you don't have power to create new employment laws, what steps are you taking to ensure they are in compliance? And given that Amazon is not a signatory to the Business Pledge, is the Cabinet Secretary pleased with the current uptake of the Business Pledge, which has been signed by less than 300 businesses in Scotland, representing less than one and every thousand businesses in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Hey. First of all, I'd say I probably didn't mention it in relation to Jackie Bailey's point, but of course we have no um, powers in relation to the raising of tax from these companies as well. The same is true, as I've mentioned already, in terms of employment law. Um, I've mentioned that I've written to Amazon and we expect to meet with them shortly. Of course, their practices are things which we uh, are looking at and which we'll review, not least, but not only in relation to the press reports which we've had over the course of the weekend. In addition to that, I think it's extremely important that we encourage companies to sign up to the Business Pledge. There are many other companies which are currently considering this. They want to know about the terms uh, and also the provisions of the business place to see if they can possibly meet them. I think it's a good initiative and it has to start. It's important that we do that. It's not something, for example, I think that the UK government has done. I would have thought that uh, uh, Dean Lockhart would have welcomed that initiative and also welcomed those 300 companies thus far and others who are considering it. The fact that they're willing to sign up to vital provisions, of course, just to remind Dean Lockhart, which include a commitment to pay the living wage. Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of repeated reports in the media that this company has been hostile towards unionisation. In fact, the JMB described it a couple of years ago as a one unionisation drive as being like uh, being in the French resistance. Um, so will the government commit towards ensuring that union membership is available and respected for staff members at all companies receiving grant funding and subsidies from the government? Cabinet yeah. Secretary. Uh, I would say to the member that we routinely do encourage companies right throughout Scotland to recognise and to work with trade unions because we believe that the uh, influence of trade unions is a positive both in terms of workforce development and the welfare of its workforce. We do that as a matter of course. Uh, of course, companies have the right not to do that, and we, when that happens, we have been willing to get involved in the past, whether to help make the connections with relevant trade unions or to further encourage them to reconsider that position, and we'll continue to do that as we deal with companies in the future. Neil Findlay. In 2012-13, Amazon paid 3.2 million corporation tax on 4 billion of UK sales and claimed back 2.5 million in public grants, and we hear, as well as any said, another million last year. Tax avoidance, low pay, poor working conditions and no trade union recognition. What exactly is the government's message to companies like this who breach the principles of fair work, breach the business pledge? Because I think the, company need, uh, the uh, government needs to call them out. These employers need exposed for what they are. They're exploiters, they're cheats and they're a throwback to a Victorian era. Cabinet Secretary. I think uh, I have done precisely the point that um, Neil Finley makes by contacting uh, Amazon, as uh, my predecessor, Rosanna Cunningham, did, where we intend to put these uh, points to them, and in particular the allegations made over the course of the weekend. And he, Neil Finley started off by talking about tax. We do not have the power to insist on a tax regime, to clamp down on what I agree with Neil Finlay is widespread, although he doesn't want to listen to it, I agree with Neil Finlay is actually widespread um, tax practices which we would not condone and we would not want to see repeated were we to have control over those tax raising powers. As ever, there's a great deal that Neil Finlay and I agree on, but he is determined at each point to make sure that is not the public perception. Regardless of that, I will continue to work to try and encourage Amazon and employers like Amazon to have good working practices, to have fair working practices and, of course, the recognised trade unions. Question number two, Anna Sauer. 
to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the latest BME GP survey. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robson. As demonstrated by the recent joint memorandum, we are working closely with the BMA to deliver a new vision for general practice and primary care, which will help address the workload challenges facing Scotland's GPs. That's why by the end of this Parliament, we'll increase spending on primary care services to 11% of the frontline NHS budget, delivering an extra half a billion pounds in building a genuine community health service with general practice at its heart. Anna Sauer. Let's look at the figures in the survey. We already knew that one in three practices are now reporting a GP vacancy and the practices are closing. But the BMA GP survey has found that 91% of GPs believe their workload negatively affects the quality of patient care. Only 7% of GPs say that consultation times are adequate. And new figures published by the BMA today show that 35% of GPs are planning to retire from general practice in the next five years. 20% of them are planning to move to part-time. 6% are planning to move abroad. And 6% are planning to quit medicine altogether. This is directly linked to the £1.6 billion cut to GP budgets imposed by this government over the last 10 years. Will this Cabinet Secretary take responsibility, accept our party has been in control of the NHS for 10 years, and accept that in her two years as Health Secretary, she has overseen a declining performance. So will she therefore take this opportunity to apologise to Scotland's GPs and their patients? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, we are getting on with working with Scotland's GPs through the BMA to deliver a new contract that will deliver a new vision for primary care, along with half a billion pounds worth of additional investment over the course of this Parliament. Can I say to Anna Sarwar, in terms of investment, in GP services, we have seen that uh, increase in cash terms each year under this government rising by £175 million pounds from £704.6 million in 2007-08 to £879.9 million in 2015-16. That is a cumulative increase of £920 million pounds under the SNP to 2015-16. But we accept there is more to be done, which is why, of course, we are working on the new contract. That's why, in the short term, I announced £20 million of a, of a package to help ease pressures on workload in the short term and contribute to putting general practice on a more long-term sustainable footing. I have said in this chamber on a number of times, I, a number of occasions, I recognise the pressures that Scotland's GPs are under, which is why we're working so hard with the BMA to deliver a new contract, a, address uh, workload issues and make sure we get general practice and primary care onto a more sustainable footing. It's clear this Cabinet Secretary doesn't do sorry to our patients and to our NHS workforce. The reality is there's been a real terms £1.6 billion cut under this government. I welcome the reversal of the cut to GP budgets, but my fear is it may be too late and nothing more than a sticking plaster approach after 10 years of SNP mismanagement. Now, Labour has been pressing the government to take steps to help alleviate the pressure and build for the long term, to firstly reverse the cuts to funding and prioritise the retention and recruitment of GPs, to increase the funding for auxiliary staff like nurse practitioners, mental health nurses, counsellors, physiotherapists and others to work in practices and support GPs, to expand the minor ailment service in pharmacies to help take the pressure of GPs and to use the opportunity of the new GP contract to renew and revitalise primary care. If this government don't change course, then as the chair of the BMA's Scottish GP committee has said today, and I quote, we could soon be in a situation where we do not have enough GPs to deliver effective care to patients. Will the Cabinet Secretary accept our proposals and avoid that being her legacy? Cabinet Secretary. So I don't regard £500 million over the course of this Parliament as being a sticking plaster. That is exactly what has been asked for by the profession, an 11% share of NHS frontline funding. That is what we will deliver, what this government will deliver. Anna Sarwar ran through a number of uh, suggestions. You should maybe look at what's already happening. All of the things that Anna Sarwar suggested are already happening. The multidisciplinary teams are exactly what the new model of 
of primary care will be built around the minor ailment services being tested in Inverclyde as we speak. Um, that is going forward. I think Anasara should perhaps do his homework before turning up here with a list that's a direct lift from what the Scottish Government is already doing. Alice Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Three weeks ago, the City of Edinburgh Council passed its local development plan, and with it rubber stamped nearly 5,000 new family homes in my constituency, a place which hasn't seen a new health centre built in 45 years. This will lead to potentially 20,000 new patients uh, exerting demands on practices that already are on their knees. Now, when I raised this with the First Minister two weeks ago, she unfairly suggested that I was trying to tell local authorities how to do their job. What I was asking for was for the Health Secretary and the Housing Minister to work together so that the planning bill can give local authorities the tools that they need to compel local developers to consider building things like health centres and to rule out developments on the grounds that there is no healthcare infrastructure. Will she today confirm to me that she will work with the Housing Benefit, uh, Minister to that end? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I say to Alex Cole Hamilton that the point that the First Minister was making uh, was, of course, that the Liberal Democrats often criticise us for what they term centralisation, and then, then they come to this Parliament asking us to tell local government what they should do around these matters. However, in a spirit of consensus, where I do agree with Alex Cole Hamilton is that we need to ensure we have the infrastructure in primary care to make sure that where there are housing developments or indeed just increased demand, and uh, that we have the infrastructure there. NHS Lothian uh, and uh, my officials and myself have, have, have had regular discussions around the need for infrastructure investment in primary care. As far as I'm aware, there are plans uh, being developed to ensure that the primary care infrastructure is fit for purpose. There are particular issues within Lothian that I've spoken to Alex Cole Hamilton and other Lothian members around uh, to make sure that we address some of those short-term issues which are very real for patients who are struggling to get access to a GP. Very happy to write to Alex Cole Hamilton uh, to give him further details of what NHS Lothian are planning and I'll do that uh, after this session. Donald Cameron. <coughs> the Cabinet Secretary may be aware that figures released today show that not only are there fewer GPs in Scotland than there were two years ago, but there are also the lowest number of practices since our party came to power. In fact, the number of practices has decreased in every year that the SNP has been in power. With rising demand, more GPs nearing retirement and a significant GP shortage, will the Cabinet Secretary take responsibility for her party's abject failure to manage primary care over the last 10 years? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, the only point I would make um, before, I absolutely accept uh, responsibility, I should say, which is why we've come up with a very, very comprehensive plan of what we're going to do to help uh, turn the situation around for general practice and primary care. The only point I would make to Donald Cameron is that the same issues he raises here today are exactly the same issues that are happening within NHS England, exactly the same. So before he levels criticisms here, he should look at the situation down south. And of course, uh, to be fair to the UK government, some of the actions they are taking to address the issues in primary care are exactly the same action that we are taking here. That is making sure that we have the right workforce in the right place, more GPs, but also more other uh, health professionals to ensure that we can deliver those multidisciplinary teams, that we uh, need to ensure that clusters are developed so that practice, practices can be supported with staff in the right places. All of the actions that I've laid out with the £500 million over the course of this uh, parliament and additional funding will help to address those issues. And I'm very, very happy happy to make sure that Donald Cameron or anyone else is furnished with the details of those if they so wish. Thank you. That concludes topical questions.